Good evening and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. BS stands for Building Science. Thanks for everyone tuning in live. This is exciting. Tonight we're going to talk about heating with wood. Um, this came up on one of our previous BS and Beer and everybody in the chat box weighed in that we needed to do a whole show specifically on this. So very excited to have you guys join us tonight. Um, I am still on the uh, January water kick, so no beer for me tonight, but uh, Emily Matram, architect here in Maine. Um, we want to really encourage you guys to do local groups. I know right now we're all pretty much still meeting virtually, but as, as Kylie said earlier, as soon as we can get back together at a brewery and have a discussion, we want to do that. So if you're not aware, if there's a local group in your area and you want to start one, uh, feel free to reach out for tips and tricks. Um, if you want to just connect to somebody locally and you need a connection, let us know. Um, and we just ask that you don't trademark the BS and beer name. Um, thank you to Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building for being our media partners and making this happen every week uh, for us. So it's been um, almost a whole year that we've been at this. It's pretty exciting. Um, tonight, we're going to have uh, guest introductions. We're going to have a panel discussion on heating with wood. Then we'll take some audience questions and, and panel discussion. Sometimes that comes up during. <laughs> Make sure you put your comments and questions in the chat box. Someone will be monitoring and trying to catch all of those as the discussion continues. And uh, we'll wrap up promptly at 7.30 Eastern time. So that's, Kylie's going to give us some announcements. Right. I'm Kylie Jacques. I'm the senior editor at Green Building Advisor. I'm drinking uh, now lukewarm peach tea. Um, if you are new to Zoom, which is hard to imagine as we were just talking about, um, just make sure if you'd like to participate when you are in the chat box to click all attendees uh, or all, a pan all panelists and attendees so we can all see your, see your comments. Um, Fine Home Building sends out Zoom reminders each week. And if you'd like more information delivered to your inbox, uh, just join our mailing list at the bsandbeershow.com or check out the weekly blog at Green Building Advisor. Um, the video recording of tonight's, pod, uh, tonight's show will be available at Green Building Advisor and we continue you to encourage the conversation over there. And all past shows can be viewed on YouTube through the uh, same link, the bsandbeershow.com. An audio version, an audio only version of this show uh, is now available wherever podcasts are found. That's a relatively new thing. Um, in terms of, okay, we've uh, put on your seatbelts. We've got a number of events coming up. On January 26th from six to eight, AIA New York will host a webcast featuring four video conversations between designers and home builders who've achieved the high performance standards of LEED for homes and or passive house. It will be followed by a roundtable discussion moderated by uh, Zach Semke of Passive House Accelerator. And on February 2nd through the 4th, Better Buildings by Design, an annual conference put on by Energy, or excuse me, Efficiency Vermont, uh, will be held, and the theme this year is Resilient Energy. Emily and Mike will both be presenting there. I will add that link and a number of others to the chat box in just a few minutes. Um, many of you know mean old Bill Robinson, and those who don't may uh, know of Skills USA, which is an organization dedicated to closing the skills gap. Bill is looking for industry professionals willing to help with the judging of product, uh, projects in June. Uh, the date for that judging is to be determined, but if you're interested in helping out, you can reach out to Bill directly at bill at trained, traintobuild.com. I'll also put that link, uh, his email address in the chat box. Um, and the whole idea is to do what you can to keep craft alive. Uh, building science leaders and friends of BSM Beer, Christoph Irwin and Miguel Walker um, will be in their team at Positive Energy in Austin, um, have opened up their discussion group. Uh, it's called the Building Science Philosophical Society uh, to anyone who wants to join. Again, link to come. I Let's see. They also have a podcast and I will share that too. Let's see. We will be joining, the brew crew here will be joining Mark Willie and Dave Cooper on their, um, they have a show BS Fridays, it's called BS Fridays, every Friday clearly, and we'll be joining them on February 19th. But to check them out in general, uh, I will share that link. And then finally, we've got our book club chosen. Let's see if I can do this. 
never can see make make things show up. But here's our book. <laughs> and it's uh, the third in our series. And it's the title of it is Essential Building Science, Understanding Energy and Moisture in High Performance Houses or House Design uh, by Jacob Diva Rakusin. And I will give you that link as well. I highly encourage you to read it and would love to have you join us on the show um, to talk about it. And that will be in April, April 1st, I think. I think that's it for me. Mike, your turn. Yes, thank you, Kylie. Uh, tonight, I am tragically out of beer, so I'm drinking a Synergy Gingerade Raw Kombucha. Uh, not, not my usual mm -hmm. beer. Um, tonight, we have uh, distinguished guests. We have uh, John Siegenthaler, professional engineer and principal at Appropriate Designs. Um, a, which is a team of high, which is a team of engineering professionals dedicated to advancing the science and proper application of modern hydronic heating. He is a mechanical engineering graduate of Rensselaer and a licensed professional engineer. John is also an associate professor emeritus of engineering at Mohawk Valley, Mohawk Valley Community College and the author of textbooks, Modern Hydronic Heating and Heating with Renewable Energy and he has written numerous other publications dealing with hydronic heating. So I have a feeling we know what uh, which direction John will be going with tonight's conversation. Uh, Albie Barden is a designer and builder of masonry heaters, cookers, and bake ovens with over 40 years of experience, as well as the inventor and manufacturer of the Albicor masonry heater kit system. Mm -hmm. Um, Albie earned a bachelor's degree from Brown University and a master's of divinity from Yale and has co-founded many organizations here in Maine, including the Common Ground Fair and the Maine Grain Alliance and its kneading conference. That's kneading with a K as in bread baking. Um, he co-authored Finnish Fireplaces, Heart of the Home, and several manuals on masonry heaters, cook stoves, and bake ovens. And he is also a closeted poet. Um, John, I totally skipped over you. Um, you would think after a year I'd have the hang of this. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to my introduction? And you want to? Um, are, are you drinking anything uh, of note? <laughs> uh, me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I I, I um, skipped past you. <laughs> actually, I just finished a glass of chocolate milk about an hour ago. So I'm <laughs> Love that. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> and and. Uh, uh, Albie, anything I missed uh, in in, uh, in your bio or anything to add? Or... No, I'm, uh, my favorite beer is made by Bigelow Brewing and it's called Jailbreak. It's a dark beer with some chocolate and other stuff in it. But uh, I'm not visiting them recently, so I'm settling for single malt scotch tonight. <laughs> That'll do. Uh, Last but not least, Patrick McComb is a senior editor at Fine Home Building Magazine. He has been testing power tools and writing about residential construction for national publications for over 17 years uh, before Fine Home Building. His articles appeared in Journal of Light Construction, Professional Deck Builder, and Fine Woodworking. He is the host of two Fine Home Building podcasts, and he is frequently on the road taking photos and visiting product manufacturers. Um, Patrick, anything you'd like to add to that? And do you have a beverage tonight? Is anybody here drinking beer tonight? <laughs> I got uh, New Asylums. Excellent. Uh, Patrick's yeah. today. <laughs> Therapy <laughs> session, which this is a new brewery in, right in Newtown. And this is actually the first beer I've had of theirs. And it's quite delicious. Nice. I'm going to try to keep myself to one or two so we don't go off the rails here on the show. <laughs> um, so uh, I... I have just a, a, a relatively quick um, introduction of the topic and then just a few photos to share. Um, so it's not super polished, but if you'll bear with me, I'll just run through uh, this, this, uh, this overview. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests for joining us tonight. Uh, many of you, including Dr. Allison Bales, uh, have asked us to do a show on wood stoves and burning wood in general. Uh, humans evolved with fire and we have a deep connection to what fire provides, space heating of course, but also cooking, security, and all of the emotions that go with those things. There are many ways to burn wood, many reasons for burning wood, and many fine points to consider. I know a lot of us are concerned about the global warming emissions associated with wood burning 
and it's an important topic I'm sure we'll touch on tonight. Um, I do want to make sure we don't try to make tonight's conversation into should we be burning wood at all. That's certainly a valid and interesting topic and one we can have uh, some time with experts on carbon emissions and climate change. Um, today's more about just using wood effectively. Uh, in preparation for tonight, for tonight, we shared Martin Holliday's GBA article, Should Green Homes Burn Wood? Uh, as a primer for tonight's topic, he notes that burning wood is technically carbon neutral. Uh, the carbon sequestered in the wood will eventually rot if left on the forest floor and release the same amount of carbon dioxide. Uh, firewood is produced and per is usually purchased and produced locally, supporting a local economy and avoids and it avoids disruptions due to tariffs or conflicts. Uh, wood burning appliances are usually simple and robust and in most cases can continue working if electrical service is disrupted or or they work well in off-grid homes. Uh, further, wood ash is a useful soil amendment, raising the pH of acidic soil and supplying other nutrients or supplying nutrients. Wood is renewable. It may take a while for a tree to regrow, but it takes a lot longer for petroleum to replenish itself. Uh, Maine, where Emily, Albie, and I all live, is by far the most heavily wooded state on a percentage basis. We, we could, you could call us wood rich. We are not rich in electricity generation and we produce no fossil fuels. Our 1.3 million residents send $800 million out of state each year for fossil fuels to heat our homes, plus a portion of the $740 million that we spend on electricity. Um, when we could be spending that money locally on a renewable resource. Um, on the other hand, wood is not a plentiful source everywhere. There is probably not enough forest for everyone to burn wood and wood smoke includes noxious pollutants that cause disease and are especially bad in cities and valleys. Storing wood takes space and we have to consider the insects and rodents that come along with firewood. So suffice to say that burning wood has its pros and cons, but it has been important to humans from the start. Um, and to kick off the conversation, I would like to ask our guests, how can we take best advantage of the pros of burning wood and minimize the cons? Um, and I do have a few images to share, not well formatted, but let me see if I can find them. So this is Albie with one of his masonry heaters. Um, this is actually one on one of my projects or it, a renovation um, I'm starting that Albie did a, did a masonry heater for uh, several years ago. Um, here's, here's another one, you get the idea, Albie likes masonry heaters, there's a cooktop on this one. And then this is uh, a, uh, an image of, of the Albie core heater system. Uh, those were just the news. <laughs> This is a uh, wood boiler I grew up with. We uh, cut and cut, split and fed uh, 11 to 14 cords into one of these suckers every year when I grew up. Uh, my dad got rid of it once my brother and I left the house. Gives you a sense of how much uh, energy those can take to run. Uh, here's, uh, here's the guts of what that looks like. So there's a heater core up there. I'm sure John can tell us more about that. Here's a bigger, a bigger version that just, these are just images I found online. Um, I don't know much about them. Um, and then this is from John's website. Um, uh, one of the products he offers is, is, a, is a drafting tool, it appears, for, for laying out hydronic systems. Um, moving on, Pat Patrick is our resident uh, wood, wood stove expert. So here's Patrick's wood stove. Um, That's Bernie, Michael. <laughs> That's Bernie? That's Bernie. Where are the mittens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so Patrick, is is the Taunton Mass? Is that is that the stove is from Taunton? Yes, it is. Cool. It probably dates to the uh, very early 1900s. We figured. Oh wow! <laughs> and here's the other end of this. That spectrum is 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 a uh, Reyes QT2 European wood stove from one of my projects, uh, 0.9 grams per hour particulate emissions, which is about three, which is about a third of the current EPA emissions. So super, super efficient, even with a fake fire. Um, so I'll stop my share there. And so go back to my question. Why don't we start with, with, with Albie? Do you want to tell us a little more, Albie, about your thoughts on how we can, on, on what are some of the ways we can best take advantage of wood? What, what should we all be doing? 
or 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 what do you like to do what, what's your preference um to give you the two opposite ends of the ways of burning wood the worst in my opinion is an outdoor boiler which can fill a valley and a community with smoke um, because when you surround a fuel that burns at 1200 degrees with water that boils at 212 degrees, you've got an all consuming thousand degree problem to solve. So when you have an outdoor boiler uh, that is taking huge amounts of wood, um, you constantly are dealing with the fact that you're not burning the gases. Most people do not understand that wood is primarily a gas fuel. More than 50% of the fuel value in wood is in the gases. So the real key in clean burning is to capture and burn the gases. Uh, the early wood boilers happened kind of out of the blue because nobody even thought that such a thing could happen. So there was no, there were no uh, regulations or anything on them. Now wood boilers are cleaner burning, but still I will encounter people who will be so thrilled that they no longer have a mess in their house, but they're still burning 10 or 12 cords of wood a year Whereas with, let's say, at the opposite end of the extreme, uh, a masonry heater might burn three, four, three cords or four cords to heat a similar size house or even less. My own son for whom I built a heater in a 3000 square foot home, very well insulated on a windy ridge, uh, they, they use less than three cords of wood a year to heat that house. And they will heat it with one fire a day typically at most two fires a day that last one to three hours. So those are the two opposite ends of the spectrum in my opinion uh, and experience. I'd also say that all wood stoves that are manufactured today have to meet an EPA requirement for emissions. So all stoves being legitimately sold today are quote clean burning. They all share the same basic features that they're designed to uh, capture and burn the gases. So probably that race unit that you showed has the same features of almost every clunky or sophisticated looking EPA approved stove. The big change that happened in modern wood stove construction was twofold. One, people realized you couldn't burn the gases if they reached the top of the stove and cooled before they had a chance to burn. So the big change that happened there was insulation was put in under the top of the stove. Usually today it's a vermiculite uh, water glass compressed board made in uh, Scandinavia and Denmark called Skamol. And that pressed vermiculite board now is often used in the ceiling and in the walls of many stoves. Uh, the second uh, thing which was understood was once you get the stove going, which can be a draft through the floor, through a grate, that can get it going fairly rapidly. But then for a long-term clean burning uh, setup, set you then uh, start bringing the air in over the fire. So imagine going into a big box store and you go through the equivalent of a mudroom and you've got air coming down over you to keep you warm as you come into that store. Imagine tubes of stainless steel over the top of the firebox with lots of little holes in them that are introducing jets of preheated air into the firebox. So it's all about shutting off most of the combustion underneath the fire and turning on the combustion to the gases as they're being, being released over the fire. So all wood stoves that currently meet EPA requirements are by definition clean burning. Masonry heaters are a tradition in Europe where by nature of the masonry hot firebox, it is clean burning from the start. I just saw a picture of a friend of mine from, uh, from, from, from Quebec, Norbert Senf, who's a leader in the masonry heater world. And he had a picture of a brick heater that he built after attending the first hands-on workshop in North America that we led in Lincolnville, Maine, 30 something years ago. And he said, this heater has been burning for 39 years. The chimney has never been burned, has never been cleaned. The heater is still sound. 
and there's no more than an eighth of an inch of fly ash or soot in the chimney. And then the final thing I'd say about promoting mainstream heaters is it's understood that they are also the healthiest form of wood heat in that they are a low grade temperature rather than a high hot surface. And so a masonry heater is actually a negative ion generator like a waterfall or ocean surf, whereas a hot metal surface is a positive ion generator. So people consistently say that in a home heated with a masonry heater, they are more comfortable, the air temperature is cooler, not, no dust is being burned in the air, and they're delighted with it if they can afford to build it in the first place. And I'll stop there as an introduction to that question. Thank you. Um, that, that's all, 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 all very interesting. John, what are, what are, you, are, are, are your thought, thought, thoughts or preferred approaches to using, using wood effectively? Uh, well, my background is in hydronic heating, which is moving heat with water. And, uh, we've been involved with designing systems uh, for about 42 years now. We've used all different types of heat sources, um, conventional boilers, heat pumps, solar collectors, and became involved with uh, high performance wood burners. Uh, as part of uh, a NYSERDA program, uh, going back to about 2013, NYSERDA launched the program. And, and NYSERDA, if you're not familiar with this, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Uh, they launched a program called Renewable Heat New York. Uh, you can Google that if you want to see some details on it. It was an incentive program to encourage uh, high efficiency, low emission burning of uh, wood. Uh, and basically two types of modern, what I'd say state-of-the-art boilers were involved. Uh, cordwood gasification boilers, which use the processes that LP was talking about, uh, very different from the outdoor wood units. Um, right now, in fact, a part of the uh, NYSERDA program, if you have one of the uh, outdoor wood burners, one of those early generation outdoor wood burners, and you decide to go with a cordwood gasification boiler or a pellet boiler. And any of these boilers have to meet qualifications that NYSERDA has put out. And I'll just summarize, they are state-of-the-art qualifications. So best in class for both cordwood gasification and pellet boilers. But if you do that, um, in addition to the incentive to put that new boiler in, NYSERDA will pay you $5,000 to decommission the outdoor wood boiler which technically isn't really a boiler, it's an outdoor wood furnace, it's not a pressure vessel. Uh, they are notorious for particulate emissions. Um, much of the time they spend with oxygen starved combustion. So we're not talking about um, using those, uh, but cordwood gasification boilers and pellet boilers, uh, pellet boilers in particular, they can attain efficiencies up pretty close to 80% under good steady state combustion conditions. Um, one of the things that's very different about a cordwood gasification boiler or a pellet boiler, if somebody is thinking about applying one of those, perhaps in, it could be in a residential project, it could be in a commercial project, very important to have thermal storage with those, uh, water-based thermal storage. And the reason for that is, uh, it goes right back when you you know when you light a fire in a wood stove or a masonry heater you don't expect the fire to go for 10 minutes and then turn off and then 15 minutes later turn on again the way some boilers do so to get high efficiency and to get low emissions it's, it's important once these units are started that they burn preferably for several hours um, rule of thumb on a pellet boiler today uh, ideally, you should have about three hours or more of burn time per start, just to give you an idea. Uh, cordwood gasification boilers are even, even longer. Uh, they're actually sized not on BTU per hour rating, but they're, they're basically sized uh, based on how many burn cycles, and I, I use the term batch burn cycles, um, 
how many batch burn cycles per day on a cold day does the owner want to deal with? Uh, a common number is two. So on a cold winter day, they might start a fire, let's say early in the morning, and uh, essentially you start the fire, you load the primary combustion chamber full of wood. They're different from a wood stove. You may be putting 65, 70 pounds of, of cordwood into that combustion chamber. And uh, the word I use to describe it, you're, you're essentially incinerating that wood as fast as you can and as hot as you can. And that generates these uh, uh, pyrolytic gases that Albi was talking about with the masonry heaters. So essentially you're turning a solid fuel into a gaseous fuel with heat in the primary combustion chamber and you're driving the gas down through a slot at the bottom of the combustion chamber using a blower and you're bringing secondary air in and mixing it with that pyrolytic gas and can, you can actually generate combustion temperatures over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And under those conditions, you're getting a nice clean burn. It actually looks like a blowtorch if you've ever seen it or heard it. Uh, very different from a nice gentle fire that you might see in a wood stove. So you have intense combustion, you have good combustion chemistry, and you're uh, removing heat using water. And that, that water is in a, it's in a heat exchanger. It's a fire, steel fire tube heat exchanger. And the modern units, they are controlled based on oxygen sensors in the flue gases. So they actually adjust, uh, they automatically adjust the uh, air fuel ratio to maintain good combustion. But the, the general idea is that you're producing heat in most cases faster than the building needs heat. And to do that and maintain those high efficiency conditions and low emissions, you need to park the heat somewhere. And in most systems, especially hydronic systems that have multiple zones, where the load on a given zone at a given time, it, it could be less than 10% of what that boiler is putting out. So you're essentially going to put that heat into a large insulated water-filled tank. And you're going to draw from that tank, just think of the tank as a BTU battery. And if you have a tank of perhaps 500 gallons of water, you get it up to 180, 190 degrees. That's a lot of heat. You could, you could calculate how much heat it is, but that could be enough heat to, to maintain a building on a winter day for 24 hours, maybe even longer. Uh, and again, I go back to the term batch burn. Uh, the cordwood gasification boilers, you're burning a batch of wood fast and furious. You're putting the heat in storage. And from there, Pretty much anything you can do with hydronic heating. You could do floor heating, you could do panel radiators, you could do fan coils, you could do domestic water heating. Um, you can certainly set up systems that have supplemental heat sources like uh, a backup boiler. Um, many of the systems that have been put in place through that NYSERDA program, they were existing hydronic systems, typically thin tube baseboard for heat emitters and an oil fired boiler for the, the heat source, the existing heat source. So in many cases, we set those systems up with either the pellet boiler cordwood gasification boiler as the lead heat source, the, the primary heat source. And if necessary, the, um, the existing boiler would come on automatically to uh, make sure that there was ample heat going to the building. Uh, so storage is a big deal. Uh, there was a fair amount of pushback on the storage requirement that NYSERDA put out there initially. And the argument is cost, obviously adding 500 gallon water storage tank, especially a pressure rated tank. It's expensive to do that. But to do, to attempt to do a cordwood gasification boiler without thermal storage is, is just a losing proposition. You will not be satisfied with how that unit operates. It simply cannot turn on and turn off the way an oil burner or a gas burner or some other type of conventional boiler can. The other thing I'll just add quickly too, if you are designing a system like this or you're considering retrofitting a system with one of these, uh, the ideal scenario is to have a hydronic distribution system that can operate at low water temperatures. 
And it's not because the boiler can't produce high water temperature. The boiler can produce uh, right up to about 200 degree water. The reason that the low water temperatures are important is again from storage. Think of the boiler as the, if you will, the battery charger. And you're gonna charge this BTU battery thermal storage tank with a lot of energy, and then you're gonna draw from it. And you wanna be able to draw several hours worth of heat before you refire that boiler. The lower the water temperature that the distribution system can operate at and still maintain comfort in the building, the longer the off cycle of the boiler is going to be. So an ideal scenario would be floor heating, low temperature slab floor heating, tied in with a pellet boiler, tied in with a cordwood gasification boiler. Um, this has been done a lot in Europe. The Austrians um, in particular, I believe about half of their total spacing energy in the entire country comes from the wood pellets at this point. So they are definitely ahead on the technology. Many of the boilers that are currently in the North American market are European products that have come over here. Um, quite honestly, they are the products that are able to meet the emission standards that the EPA has right now. And as such, they're on the qualified technology list for the, the NYSERDA program. Um, I guess that's a summary. It, I don't know if there's any specific questions or other. Well, yeah, well, I Could think- I tell I think a story? Sure. I tell a story about uh, wood-fired boilers? Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, my, my dad taught at the University of Maine, and I went to school with uh, a girl named Judy Hill, and her father was Richard Hill, who was the uh, engineering department at the University of Maine. And Richard Hill was the inventor of one of the first uh, clean burning boilers, such as John has described. And I can remember going to, John, uh, to Richard's. Dick Hill was my friend for probably, I don't know, 60 years or so. So we were always good friends, even though he was a generation older. And I remember when he was inventing the Hill boiler, which was if you took a 55 gallon drum and filled it with water and then fire brick at the bottom of it. And then you lifted the lid on the drum and you loaded your wood in the top of the 55 gallon drum. The bottom of the wood would be burning, but not the top because it was staying cool by the water around it. And then out of the bottom of that, where he had a forced draft coming in, he had a high temperature refractory fire brick tunnel where the secondary air was introduced that John has just described. And that's where the gas burn was happening. After the burn was complete, and only then was the heat that had been produced exposed to the water for heat exchange. And then he had like a, a thousand gallon tank in his basement. So after he showed me all of this and how it worked, he said, come on, Albie, let's climb up onto the roof. And so he climbed up onto the roof and he had me breathing the quote, smoke or no smoke out of the top of the burning system. And all we could breathe was water vapor. It was really an extraordinary demonstration of what John has just described. When you're separating the combustion process using water from the heat exchange process, when you can get it in your head that it has to be kept separate, then you can come up with a clean burning hydronic system. Interesting. Patrick, do you have any, any, any uh, thoughts out of the gate here you'd like to share? The systems that John and Albie are talking about are so different than what I have, which is a, you know, a hundred plus year old cast iron wood stove. And um, I would say the heating with wood is more of a lifestyle choice than a heating choice. If, if you're cutting and, and splitting your own wood and carrying it into the house and stoking a fire every half hour or every hour, it's really a lot different than turning up your thermostat and uh, getting heat from some other machine, right? But the, the joy of that experience, I think, is the reason that a lot of people do it. And uh, if you have your own wood lot or you live in a rural area, your heating fuel is virtually free, accepting the labor for you to gather it. And I think the uh, experience of, of heating with wood is something that I've only recently 
uh, been introduced to because of the you know COVID outbreak. Now I'm forced to work in what was a very occasional use building as a workshop, and now it's my office, and I'm heating it all the time. And I don't know that I could figure out a more economical way to heat it than how I'm doing it with this old wood stove. Um, no, that's that's a good point. Um, with 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 all all of 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 these systems, do, um, do people normally do backup systems? Are backup systems required? What's um, yeah? What's 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 the story? Uh, or starting with Alby, are, are are masonry heaters usually the only heat source? And and in a related question, what what types of homes do they work best in? Like I've 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 heard I've heard that because they give heat heat so long and put out so much heat that you can't have a that maybe they're not a good fit for a small tight house but i can imagine a big house that has a lot of chopped up rooms may not be a good a good fit either so what's what's your experience there in my own home which is an 1830s cape four four rooms on four rooms with a back L that probably has another 1800 square feet and two floors we basically, and, and an 1830s cape was designed, uh, my two chimneys on the main building are like six feet in from the ends of the building. And so the original home had four rooms on four rooms and every room had its own door. You heated the room you were in, you did not try to heat the whole house. And I'm told, and I have never been able to verify it, that if you had like an open type fireplace the amount of wood it would take to heat that room for that winter would be the volume of wood that it would take to literally fill that room, which is pretty daunting, uh, but I suspect that was true. Because people were heating in an older house like this, run room at a time, uh, they were only heating the room they were in when they were in it. And so they had something that was pretty quick response. When I bought this house 50 years or so ago, it had the original chimneys. They had torn out the original fire frames. I went around and found pieces of it on the property. And then I purchased antique fire frames that matched the original. I built a new chimney uh, and then I had central heating cook stoves, which were clean burning, but very effective hydronically. I was able to, at one point in a day in July, I was laying in bed upstairs, sweating, unable to unable to sleep. It was so hot. And I heard the oil furnace come on. And I said, this is crazy. The oil furnace is coming on to keep hot water hot in the middle of a hot summer day in an insulated tank. I'm not going to do this anymore. And I went downstairs and I threw the emergency switch on the oil boiler. And for 20 years after that, there was not a drop of oil burned in this house. I then purchased a HS Tarm boiler that you pictured earlier with a young man standing next to it, a wood oil boiler, which was both wood and oil. And I found it very unpleasant to use the wood portion of that boiler because I had to go downstairs to use it. There was no fun doing that. And every time I loaded it, smoke would come into the room. So now the HS Tom boiler, which I nestle up to every morning when I use my rowing machine, it has the oil burning very, very well. The distribution system is great, but the primary heat we use are two masonry heaters. One, we have the central heating, uh, that's not the right word. I have the big soapstone heater cook stove in our kitchen, which is warm all day, all night long, uh, because it's a big mass and we do keep refueling it, but it's burning very clean. So that takes care of that part of the house and it spills over into the dining room. And then in the den, which is part of the back L of the house, where I have my little office where I'm sitting now, and our very big bedroom, we heat that with a second, smaller soapstone masonry heater, one made in Norway. Um, in any case, we close off the sewing room, the living room, and some of the upstairs bedrooms for the winter time, except when we need to heat them. And when we need to heat them, we open a register in the floor or we turn on the thermostat a little bit. So we shrink our living space in the winter. So maybe a third of the total space we have. And in so doing, we're able to really pretty much heat with wood, probably 80 to 90% of what we're doing. Uh, and then the oil is the backup. 
and the oil is also producing the domestic hot water. It's possible to put water coils remotely in a masonry heater so you're not lowering the combustion chamber. And you can, in fact, do most of your domestic hot water heater heating from the masonry heater. But I don't do that today because it's a liability that I don't want to carry for somebody that says, okay, Albie's given me a water jacket. Now I'm going to hook it up, but I don't really know what I'm doing as a plumber. So I'm not going to have the right uh, relief valves and expansion tanks and gravity feed to a tank upstairs. So I don't do that anymore, but I did a lot of that 20 and 30 years ago and created all the heat, all the domestic hot water, everything somebody wanted just from a masonry heater. So that's our solution here. There's a third masonry heater, actually my, my partner, Michelle, upstairs in the loft, was the loft of the back L is now a beautiful, L-shaped uh, studio for her. And we have a little German masonry heater called the San Cal, made by an old friend of mine, now deceased Alfred Eisenstein. And that little uh, ceramic box heater based on the traditional Kochelofen of Euro Germany has a gentle, gentle heat, takes a very little wood and you can go up and fire it an hour ahead of time. And then for the entire time you're up there, it's just wonderful heat. When you get up in the morning, there's still heat in that room from that wonderful masonry heat source. So we actually have three in our house and we fire them uh, based on the season and how we're using them. And I wouldn't be burning wood if I didn't enjoy it. It's incredibly hard work to get a year's worth of wood drying and in place and stacked in addition to this year's wood, which is already dried and stacked. You're carrying the wood every year, every day, but it seems to me in Maine, it's unless you've got a zero energy home and you've got active solar energy, and we just did add active solar in our big barn. So all our powers now are coming from solar. Uh, but unless, unless you have a very modern zero energy loss home, wood, in my opinion, if you're burning it clean, is the ethical choice to be making in Maine. So we work hard at it, we enjoy it, we believe it. We also think it's the healthiest way to burn the wood uh, by using a mason heater or three. Or, or three, well, or M plus you have your bake oven yeah. on a trailer you take to the fair, right? Well, somebody had mentioned earlier, and I think this is probably on some people's minds anyway, if you are in a tighter house and you do want to burn wood, what's, you know, what are some of the considerations there and I, I kind of wonder about temperature control. Um, it just feels like I have a wood stove, much like Patrick's, and it's it, especially in an open concept lofted situation. It's you know comfortable during the day, but even if I let it, you know, if if I stop stoking the fire four hours before I'm ready to go to bed, it's still crazy hot upstairs. And I just feel like if you're doing it the old-fashioned way, there's some temperature control issues. I don't know if you can speak to that yeah. at all. And also well, that, in, classic, in an energy efficient house tight, tight on globe. The classic dilemma that occurs uh, with precisely that situation, the smallest house you're gonna get is gonna be a tiny house. And the average person building a tiny house, unless they're very well off and are doing it both for ecological and ethical reasons, but also kind of as a design experiment. A lot of the young people in Maine that are building tiny houses are doing it for survival. And inevitably, they wind up purchasing an antique steel or cast iron stove, which blasts them out of the space. Or when it's out, they're, they're freezing their ass off. So designing a masonry heater for a small space is a really critical design challenge. And the point, the point is, uh, and John spoke to this, always think of the masonry heater as a battery. Whether it's uh, a big water tank or a masonry heater, you are creating a battery. Once you've got a battery, whether it's a big water tank or a big mass of masonry, you are no longer dealing with a five or 600 uh, temperature surface. You're dealing with a surface temperature in the water, in John's case, of probably something in the 150 to 180 degree range, which is pretty comfortable, uh, which is what's coming out of your baseboard radiation or in the case of a masonry heater, you're dealing with a surface temperature of 120 or 130 degrees, which is also very comfortable. 
And because I'm concerned about people in small places with limited budgets, I've gone out of my way. I'm not trying to break. I'm just trying to solve problems. I've gone out of my way to design small heaters for small spaces that are also relatively inexpensive. And the smallest heater I've ever designed, which I'm really thrilled about, I'm calling the one flue tile heater. So you take the largest clay flue tile that's manufactured. So imagine in your mind's eye, a two foot tall, two foot square flue tile, clay flue tile, that's almost two inches thick. You line that with four and a half inches of fire brick. You take a second flue tile and you cut it in half and put it under the flue tile as a stand. Now you have a, a system that is basically two feet square, three feet tall with a metal top on it, top loading. That little cook stove can handle a very small space like a tiny house, a 400 or a 500 or a 600 foot space with a tiny amount of wood, but because it is such a large thermal mass compared to the amount of wood you're burning in it, you've got a seven inch or an eight inch thick wall that is slowly giving off heat rather than rapidly giving off heat. So my young friend, Jesse Cottingham, who did a video of his little tiny house heater, they fire it at night, they cook their meal on it. When they get up in the morning, the heater is still warm, but the fire has been out for seven hours. So my recommendation to somebody in a small house, such as what you're describing, Kylie, is build a small heater. There's no penalty from having the right size heater. You're not blasting yourself out. You're trying to create a steady state environment rather than way up the scale and way down the scale. And a masonry heater can do that. Excellent. Sure. It's a two tile. Sure. This, this oh, is a, a two tile heater. This is one I designed for an 800 square foot house for a couple down east in Maine. So that's two two foot square tiles with a fire brick lining. And all of this is online with the plans and everything and the materials. And they saw it in my home and they fell in love with it. They didn't have a lot of money. They wanted to buy my unit used. And I said, okay. And uh, they both go to work early in the morning. They fire it when they get up for an hour, an hour and a half. The fire is out when they leave for work. When they get home eight or nine hours later, the house is as warm as when they left it. The heater is still heating and they fire it at night, one and one and a half hours. They go to bed, it's warm in the morning, it's warm when they get home. It's a steady state all the time. That was an affordable solution for them using low technology rather than something really fancy. So you can get fancy stuff and you can do low tech stuff, but the principle of a large mass appropriate to the space that holds heat at a steady state. That's the key. Is that how do you need like little pieces of wood to put in the masonry he heaters? Isn't that correct? It's not like normal pieces of cordwood or am I wrong on that? Uh, uh, you, I think you are wrong. If you are looking at some of the European systems that are prefab kits that are really beautiful that come out of, let's say Norway, for example, or the, the Norsk Kleber, from Norway and we're using one of those in our den right now. Uh, or the beautiful, beautiful stoves that come out of Holland, which are tough to pronounce, but they were designed by a master carpenter uh, who was also a farmer who went to a hands-on workshop led by my longtime ally and Finnish friend, Heike Hutianen, who I was friends with for 40 something years. He recently passed. But he went to a hands-on workshop and he built a beautiful brick heater in his very modest Dutch home in the little village in Holland where he lived. And then he said, you know, I'm a carpenter. I think I could make some kits out of beautiful cast refractory with color and a polished surface. And so he designed a kit system, which is modular and you can stack additional tiers, one, two, three, four tiers on top of the basic firebox. But he used the the finished contraflow design to get a clean burn. And then he made it a size appropriate for the very modest homes of Holland. And when you see the videos of those, I'll pronounce it, you may not be able to find it. It's like tickle cockle or tickle cockle. If you look online for those Bless videos, you. you'll see somebody <laughs> taking those very, very small pieces of wood and putting them in the firebox. And you say, holy cow, nobody in Maine is ever going to use wood that size. We are 
We are hardcore 16 inch wood or more, <laughs> unless we are happy to burn wood that takes tremendous amount of labor to cut it down to 12 inches. So uh, I'm always looking for something that'll take 16 inch wood. And to speak directly to your comment, Patrick, about uh, the little wood, the, the, t the, uh, the little Norsk Kleber that I have in my den right now that's behind me um, is a very small firebox. And it's a pain in the butt to put the small wood in it, even though that is what is recommended by the manufacturer. And I have found that the way for me to effectively use that stove is I'm buying what is only available, frankly, in Maine, which are the swamp mat cutoffs. These are the companies in Maine, all over Maine, that are taking log, hardwood logs. They are squaring them off. They are cutting them to a fixed length. And then they are bolting them together so people like P CMP can buy these mats of corduroy prefabbed mats of road work so they can lay them down in fields and swamps <clears throat> and put their heavy equipment on it without destroying the land. There's a company in, in Maine, north of me, that ships them all over the, all over the United States. Miss Maine has this resource. <clears throat> so I'm buying swamp mat cutoffs that are blocks of wood that are eight inches square hardwoods or eight by 12. And I've got one of those blocks in my stove right behind me now, and it'll burn three, three or four hours because the surface area is limited, but the volume is considerable. So only the surface area is what's burning. And as a result, I get a very long clean burn. If I take that same firebox and fill it with finely split wood, it's like putting a bunch of chopsticks in the wood, in the, in the stove. Everything wants to burn at once. There's never going to be enough oxygen to burn clean, and it's going to be done, and most of the heat went up the chimney. So I found that by using a large squared block, and the other product that's readily available would be the pressed sawdust blocks, which are the bio blocks that you can buy in you know, any hardware store today. Those as stacked, again, give you a limited surface area. So you're gonna get a little bit of wood burning at a time over a long period of time. So it's gonna be clean burning as a result and you're gonna get a long, gentle heat cycle. Excellent. No, you don't have to have little, little pieces <laughs> of wood, even if a European manufacturer recommends it. Sure. John, with uh, or with or with hydronic systems, I imagine um, you know a a, a big um, a big advantage of that is 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 consistent even distribution if, if the system is designed well. Um, what 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 types of home, are are there limitations on the types of homes? You know, a lot of us uh, uh, here are doing um, high performance homes. You know, so smaller and air, relatively airtight. Um, so that, that was part one of the question. Oh, and, and then um, what do people typically use as backup heat, if anything? Sure. Yeah, uh, you know, a hydronic based system with, you know, cordwood gasification boiler, pellet boiler, it's not a fit for a tiny house. Um, I don't think it's a fit for a passive house. The smallest pellet boilers that are available in North America right now are about 25 kW thermal output. So roughly around 80,000 BTs per hour. Uh, from a practical standpoint, um, you know, I would say probably houses with design loads of 50,000 BTs per hour. There, there's really no hard cutoff, but the capital cost of putting in a hydronic based system with either one of those boilers in a house that has very, very low energy, it just, there's just no good return on investment there. Um, but to, to a point that, that Kylie was asking or wondering about, one of the, the advantages that hydronics does bring is you can do very accurate temperature control on a zone by zone basis. Um, you know, you, you can do a lot more than what you can do with a single heat source in a central location in a building. Um, and as I say, you can also add loads like domestic water heating to it quite easily. Um, so hydronics bring some advantages in, in terms of comfort control. Um, 
and Michael, I think you asked too about backup. It's not a requirement. You could do a system with a cordwood gasification boiler or a pellet boiler as the sole heat source. But from a practical standpoint, what we have found, at least in implementing this program that NYSERDA is running, uh, most of those systems are existing systems. And you know, when we started this program, fuel oil was about $4 a gallon in upstate New York. So heat from pellets was roughly about half the cost per million BTUs. And that was one of the, the main drivers is people that are going through a fair amount of oil uh, could cut their operating costs by going to pellets. But it, I will tell you that doing even a small pellet boiler with thermal storage and low temperature distribution, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars as a minimum. So, you know, in a house that's going to use a hundred dollars worth of energy over a winter, it's just not a, a practical investment there. Um, I think it makes sense in some commercial applications. We've designed systems for highway garages, for example, uh, where loads are up 300, 400,000 BTUs per hour. And it's possible to do that with a single pellet boiler. It could also be done with staged pellet boilers. Um, typically when we design a system like that, we're going to have a backup boiler in there Seven simply o'clock. because at some point that pellet boiler may need service. And if it's down, those facilities need to have reliable heat. So typically it's going to have either oil or propane as a backup. Um, district heating is another application. We don't see a lot of it yet. Uh, there's a fair amount of it being done in British Columbia, Canada. And a system might uh, use a boiler, oh, capacity wise, anywhere is from half a million to a million BTUs per hour. And when you get up into that scale of boiler, there are products available that can burn pellets or wood chips. Uh, They can reconfigure the combustion chamber, reconfigure the fuel supply. And that might supply half a mile of underground insulated piping and buildings are connected to a common distribution system. And the client buildings uh, have what are called BTU meters in them. So it is measuring the flow rate and the temperature change of the water as it comes from the district system through the distribution system in the building. And of course it cools off, goes back out. So by measuring the flow and the temperature drop, you can actually calculate how much thermal energy you're drawing from the system. And um, uh, that, that has been a practical application. Uh, there is a system right now up in Raybrook, New York, near Lake Placid. It's the state office campus up there. Uh, there's three agencies up there, the state police, uh, the Adirondack Park Agency, and uh, DEC, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. And that has a pellet boiler system, three pellet boilers that are staged with underground piping. It's a 1.7 million BTU per hour system. And that's um, all those client buildings have BTU meters that are keeping track of the amount of energy that comes from the district system. And they're, they've set up a system for you know, payment based on, on what their energy use is. So I do see uh, hydronic based systems, uh, again, not a fit for passive, not a fit for tiny houses, not a fit. Even I, I would say anything under 50,000 BTUs per hour as a design load. Uh, probably not a a good investment there. Uh, It's not that it can't be done. It's a matter of justifying the capital required to do that versus something like a heat pump as as another option. Right. And just for anybody um, who doesn't uh, talk about BTUs per hour daily, um, a a typical passive house or a pretty good house in Maine uh, might use... might need 10,000 to 20,000 BTUs per per hour. Uh, You're saying the cutoff is about 50,000 and um, you're doing systems that are 400,000 or a million BTUs per hour. So it's it's basically at least an order of magnitude oversized for the typical um, high performance home. But if you have a larger house or a house that's more more of a code minimum or worse house, which most homes are, that then it could start to make financial sense possibly. 
Yeah, and, and the district systems too. Uh, yeah. Some Europeans uh, have set up uh, district heating systems in, in villages that have a central heating plant that would have biomass boilers in it as, as probably as well as a backup boiler system. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, when you have a, a scale like that, you have load diversity and you know, you can, you get a, um, an economy of scale there that you would not get with a low energy house. Right. Just, uh, right. I was going to say, there were a lot of questions too surrounding kind of all of these different heating with wood systems and like what something like that would cost. So if you're talking, so we're talking a home and it's got 50,000, you know, BTU, what are they looking at for a wood boiler versus, you know, a traditional boiler system? Well, it, um, Emily, it's, it's going to depend. It, is there an existing distribution system? Are you talking new construction where you'd be building the whole distribution system? Um, you know, if it's I think it, or, I mean, if you could answer that either way. Um, sure. I think obviously it sounds like, you know, in the low load houses, it doesn't make sense. So maybe practically more people are looking at these as renovation situations or yeah. for larger houses. That, so. that, that has been my experience with the NYSERDA program. Uh, nine out of 10 are retrofits. Um, to take an existing house that has a, a, a decent hydronic distribution system in it, to put a pellet boiler thermal storage, um, pellet storage itself, uh, right now, uh, NYSERDA's requirement is an outdoor pellet storage device, a hopper or a silo. Um, I would say a minimum of $15,000, possibly up to 20,000, depending on the size of the boiler and so forth. And that, you know, that assumes an existing distribution system in the, in the building. If it was new construction, uh, again, you know, hydronic systems could be very simple or they can be very elaborate, but um, probably add another 10,000 to that to do, you know, a, a state-of-the-art radiant panel heating system in perhaps a 2,500 to 3,000 square foot house. To continue the, thank you. To continue the cost discussion, I'll be, you know, you said with your masonry heaters uh, earlier, if people can afford to build them. So, you know, what, what kind of range, uh, you know, you have a smaller unit and you have, you know, kind of larger ones. What are people looking at for, for range? And then um, there was another question that came up on, on weight. Is the weight similar to a traditional fireplace or just weigh more? Many years ago, I had a young couple from Quebec come to my home and uh, they were very keenly interested in a masonry heater and they didn't have uh, any money and uh, they said we really want one but we have no money and I said well here's what you do uh, here are the plans I'm going to give you the plans I'm going to coach you from a distance go to the dump find some castings that are old stoves that have been thrown away or old boilers Go to another place and find used bricks, clean the bricks. Go to another place and find used fire bricks, clean the fire bricks. And if you put all of that sweat equity into it, you'll have a very, very low cost, but at the end you'll have a masonry heater. And I didn't hear anything from them uh, for several months. And then one day I got a card with photographs in it with the completed heater. I hadn't made a penny from it, they hadn't bought anything from me, but they had a masonry heater that they had done for, I would assume, a few hundred dollars. Uh, that's not what the average person pays. The average person pays a great deal more than that. The reason I designed the masonry heater series that were made from flutile liners was to give people who had a do-it-yourself mentality and a limited budget a way to get a genuine masonry heater with instructions as to how to do it. So the materials for my one tile cook stove heater for a tiny house, those materials cost are probably around $2,000. If you're doing a two tile heater, you're probably looking at $3,000 or more of just materials. Uh, the labor is gonna be, uh, you're gonna need saws, you're gonna need time, you're gonna need to find the stuff in Maine as a large family operated uh, concrete block uh, operation called Gagney. They have now plants all over Maine. So you can go to Gagney's and you can get the tiles, you can get the fire brick, you get the mortar, 
and I have the plans and the plans are online, they're free. So, and I do workshops so I can teach people how to do it. If it's a brick heater, I've taught brick heater workshops all over the country in Canada uh, and elsewhere. And so people learn from there and they learn how to build their own. If somebody's building a full size mason heater <clears throat> in a new home of let's say 2000 square feet, and they're doing a three foot by four foot by seven foot tall mason heater, um, they're probably gonna have, by buying new materials, they're probably gonna have $7,000 plus, probably close to $10,000 in materials costs if everything is masonry. And that's gonna include a foundation in the basement, the capping slab, reinforcement, insulation between the capping slab and the living level, the brick heater, a brick chimney all the way through the roof, the flashing, et cetera. There's probably at least $10,000 materials in that. And if you're hiring it, you're easily gonna pay double that or triple that in labor. So <clears throat> I've, I've, I've built heaters for people for very little money. I've given away a lot of time to people that had no money because I believe in masonry heaters. And I've built heaters that were very elaborate, very complicated, very, very elegant. The most expensive one I ever did was in a cathedral ceiling, completely gutted and re, re, redone log home where we tore down the horrible first chimney, the horrible stone veneer. We poured a new footing, we came back up through and we did a hand cut custom made soapstone heater with heated benches and a soapstone veneered chimney that was 20 plus feet tall through the roof and then a granite cladding above the roof in the middle of the winter. The project was $100,000, it would cost more today. But that was an incredibly uh, elaborate project and it won a national award. Today, I have expensive when I'm building, taste. I'm usually building That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking the same thing. Like, you know, that sounds like delightful. <laughs> yeah, that sounds amazing. People to participate. We always want people to participate rather than just being the lookers. You know, if they can carry bricks or help and design or fabrication, we want them to be involved. But this is a skill within a skill. And uh, we find that people can teach themselves to do it with some training. And sometimes those are the best heaters of all. The, the accountant who said, I want a mason heater. I can't afford it. I can't afford to come to a workshop and I'll build it myself. And over two months, what might have taken me maybe a week and a half to build, they build a beautiful heater. So there were also a ton of questions about wood stoves, Patrick, and I know we didn't get to talk uh, quite as much. I thought this would go really wood stove heavy, honestly, when we when we talked about this. So, so I'm loving the discussion. Um, there were, uh, I know your particular wood stove is kind of the older traditional version. Um, I don't know how much you've done uh, with some of the more modern ones like Mike has shown, I mean, you know, Mike can weigh in too, but there were questions about um, well, we'll go back to the cost question, you know, typical cost of installing wood stoves. Is it usually the backup or the primary? And, you know, what the one question that came up was using wood stoves in, you know, high performance houses where, you know, what's the, what's the best concept to do in, you know, in a passive house when you want to put in a wood stove. So I don't know if you want to jump on any of those. Uh, it would be unfair to. to characterize my barn as equivalent to the heating loads of a <laughs> passive house, but I can tell you it is reasonably airtight. It's less than three air changes per hour. And to get the thing going, when I come out here, I often have to open the window to get the draft. After the thing gets heated up, I can close the window. Um, and as Kylie pointed out, you know, in a low load building, it is very hard to maintain the right fire rate to keep it comfortable without overheating and keep the fire going. So it's a balancing act and it depends on a lot of conditions. Like I've noticed, and I'm sure other folks who heat with wood even partially know that when it's raining outside and close to, uh, you know, the Delta T's are limited, it, getting the thing to work sometimes can be very difficult. And those problems are worse in a house with lower loads than my barn, I'm sure. Yeah, I think also too to add to that, you know, with the questions for the people who are who are asking about the the low load houses too is um, like Mike's raise. Um, we've used Hearthstone as well with direct um, 
direct to the firebox outdoor air, which is, which is great. Um, but it also is cool. So when it's negative 15 degrees out, the cold air it's putting in there is cold. And, um, We've had I've heard of those who, pipes frosting over, uh, and when it's you know very low temperature outside. So yeah. So just a a a great trick I learned from Steve Bazek, architect, is uh, put a plumbing valve outside uh, uh, of the intake air, so at least you, you're, you're you're blocking that intake air when you're not using the stove. Mm. And there's, um, uh, there's a. My friend Heike Hutiana had, I think, something like seven or eight different masonry heater experiments in his uh, in his lake home. He lived in a little apartment upstairs in Helsinki during the winter months, but in the summer months he played out in the country, as many Finns do. They go to the forest, and uh, he made a big, big point of that question Emily has addressed about outside air, and so you need you need uh, makeup air. Uh, for something that's burning wood to work. But if you put very, very cold outside air directly into a firebox, you are lowering the combustion temperature in the firebox and you're making the fire struggle to reach the temperature it needs to get to in order to be clean burning. So when I build masonry heaters, I always refuse to put outside air directly into the firebox. I'm always happy to put outside air into the room next to the heater. And I do that by bringing in an outside uh, vent uh, and I put it off to one side or the other so no coal can ever jump out and jump down into uh, a register and then into a PVC pipe. And I coach people to buy a Regio register, which is available online. It's a high quality cast iron closable register that you can kick open with your foot and that can make a difference of at least 100 degrees in the temperature of the air that you're allowing into the firebox. So that's the system I use, and that's been quite successful. If people don't think to put that in, and I've got a friend who just called me from York. We built a heater with him this spring, and he said, Albie, I've, I'm getting a little smoke out around my uh, oven door. And I said, well, you know, that's a very well-gasketed door, but I think Mr. Smoke is unhappy and he's choking to death because he can't breathe. And because he can't breathe, he's reaching out into the room around any gap he can find in order to get the air he needs in order to burn. And I said, I have a suspicion that since you didn't put in outside air, he's trying to reach into the room to get his combustion air. And that's what's causing your smoking. He said, well, I don't have that problem when I crack the window a little bit. And I said, well, that's it. It's very likely that you did not provide the outside air I recommended. I'm not trying to beat up on him. And so he's using up the available oxygen, creating a negative pressure in his room. And he can only solve that by opening up a little bit. The same problem can happen at the other end. If, the, if somebody puts a, a metal bestest style class A chimney on the roof and puts a spark screen on it, and not a lot of time that spark screen, spark screen can become occluded with a very fine fly ash that looks like the, the, uh, the, the, the onion skin paper that my father used to write five copies of an, a, month, a weekly newsletter to every member of the family. And it would all go through the typewriter. There was no printer. So these pieces of paper were very thin. You could literally see through them. So if you look up a chimney that has that spark screen on it, you can see light at the top of the chimney. And I remember going to a house in New Hampshire where they, everything worked fine for the first month. And then they started calling and says, Albie, we're getting smoke. There's something wrong. And I said, check the cleanouts, make sure they're closed, check the dampers, make sure they're open. Every day the call got angrier. And I went over there and I said, do you have a ladder? And they said, yes. I said, I'm going to climb up on your roof. I climbed up on the roof. And after I had left and built the chimney, they had decided without telling me to put a quarter inch grid of hardware cloth on top of the chimney. And that quarter inch grid of hardware cloth had picked up the fly ash like hair in the, the drain on your bathtub. And uh, I brought that screen, screen down with a fine onion skin layer of ash on it. And I said, here's the problem. Uh, don't ever put that back on. You're fine now. I fixed your heater. And that was it. That was the solution. So. You have to solve it at both ends. 
you have to let the air get out and you have to let the air get in, but you can preheat the air before it goes into the firebox. And that's critical to get at the beginning of the burn, the firebox is gonna be cooler than in the middle of the burn. So you wanna give it every advantage you can to get it to a high temperature. And you do that by giving it preheated air. What's um, uh, in re relation to that, um, Doug asked in the, in the chat, um, what, what's the coolest air, right? So they have, it doesn't get cooler than 20 degrees. Is that still too cold? You know, you want to preheat the mm. air. So obviously if you're using room temperature air, it's more like 70, it's not. I think, I think the stove manufacturers that are bringing in outside air directly are solving the problem of not creating negative pressure. They're not creating a vacuum where something's going to smoke because it doesn't have air. But the clean burn that they got when it was tested in an EPA lab, at the beginning of that burn, they're probably not getting a clean burn when it's very, very cold air. So the real life uh, circumstances are probably different than the lab circumstances where, <laughs> where it may not have been using the same temperature air. So any way anybody can figure out how to get the air into the room without it being super cold, in my opinion, would be a cleaner way to burn the stove. Brian asks if there's a rough quantity of air per, per uh, million BTUs of the fire that's required. The, the uh, rule of thumb I've heard is that uh, once, once, when you're starting a fire, you need, I think it's 20 to 30 CFM. And once a fire is burning, cleanly, you need maybe 10 to 15 CFM, which is really not a very big volume, which is why the makeup air kits are usually like three inches. Um, is, 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 is that, that accurate as far as you know? Or does it depend on the, yeah, on the situation? The engineer. I'm the engineer, I'm just a theologian. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, I could tell you there are some pellet boilers that have direct outside air ducting and I believe it's either three inch or four inch going into uh, like a 25 or 30 kW pellet boiler. Now that air does not go directly into the combustion chamber. It actually goes inside the jacket of the boiler and spreads out around the internal components. And that's the preheating function before it goes into, into the combustion chamber. I can, I can come back at that. I being a little cute there, but John is the engineer and I'm not. But imagine that the masonry heater or any stove is a vacuum cleaner. It's pulling air from the room in order to feed the combustion process. It's only gonna take as much as it needs or as much as the draft in the chimney is pulling. And the stronger the draft in the chimney, the more it's gonna grab, even if it may not need that much. So when I bring the air into the room next to the heater, in a masonry heater, it's an aggressive burn. So I'm not worried about it um, taking too much air. What I'm wanting to be sure is that it has enough air. And by my floor register in the vicinity, uh, um, I know I have enough air when it's open. If I've got a four inch or a six inch uh, diameter ductwork going to outside, hopefully coming through a heated basement where it's being preheated as it comes into the room. But the air that's going into the heater is actually room air and I'm mixing fresh outside air with room air. So I always have fresh air in the room and I'm using the preheated room air to actually fuel the system. After an hour and a half, I go over and I kick the thing closed. There's no more outside air coming in. I didn't have to worry about the volume. I just had to go through that one step of opening it and closing it, which coordinated, coincided with my burning and my shutting down of the dampers. It's not a big deal. It just it's a natural part of how you work the thing. Also in an older house, many people that have burned masonry heaters have found they don't have to do any kind of uh, outside air source. There's just enough infiltration happening in a non-airtight older house to give plenty of oxygen to a masonry heater process. But today when we're building for clients where everybody's building with much more insulation, much tighter homes, we routinely request that they put in outside air. Or, or and just to go back to uh, Emily, Emily, I think I think was asking about uh, wood stoves in, in in passive house and pretty good houses. Uh, one of of my favorite tricks is to uh, include a three season room 
uh, next to the house that's not well insulated, that's much more like my 1820 house, and you put the wood stove out there and you just keep it out of the house, <laughs> that's that that's the easiest way, way to deal with deal with wood wood with burning wood in an airtight house. Yeah, and I think all the ones we've done have all been, you know, European, very like one stick of wood, and they use it for five to eight degrees when they're in the living room on those days when it's negative 15 degrees out, or um, God forbid, this is Maine, the power goes out, right? So it's a, it's a good backup for the all electric house. And you just, you know, you have to be careful about, I think any kind of wood that you have, you have to, you have to know how to manage the system. Somebody asked earlier about, and, and this is probably a pretty rare situation. I'm picturing a cabin or something, but if a wood stove were your, you know, one and only source of heat, how do you, uh, you know, take care of uh, the, what do you do about uh, pipes possibly freezing? Keep the fire going. <laughs> but what if you're not there for a few days? House I, I sitter. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I think it's probably a pretty straight, you know, you know, atypical situation, but somebody did ask that. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, my in-laws are off, off grid and have been for 40 years. Um, and, and their, their only source, source of heat is a wood stove and the sun. So just when, when they travel or, uh, um, uh, somebody has to go over and feed the fire. Just that's 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 how the house is heated. That's how it's been heated for 40 years. There's never been a frozen pipe. Um, it's it's reasonably well built for you know 1975, but it's two by sixes with fiberglass and not particularly in, in a similar yeah. vein. But you know, so when we lose electrical power, the rest of us like your heating system goes out. But if you're heating with a wood stove, you still got heat and. Yeah. I can't imagine any more resilient if you have a, a supply of wood. You can you're not go the, out the, the whole along the whole winter without having to uh, have electricity without mm -hmm. and not freeze to death. And you're not polluting the neighborhood with noise from your generator. Yeah. Well, yeah, because that's the when alternative we, backup a, is generator. Yeah, <laughs> they're obnoxious. Mm -hmm. When we get a power outage here, we, we kind of celebrate it because we know mm -hmm. we're fine. And we have some candles, we have some kerosene lamps and the same heat that we had before the power went out is still present. Mm -hmm. So we actually enjoy the kind of time off from uh, everything else that's crazy around us and mm -hmm. everything just keeps chugging along. We do have a generator, we have four freezers. It's really the freezers and the water pump that we're worried about because we put an awful lot of food away from our gardens and farming. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, speaking of the freezing pipes, in an older house, which mine is with granite foundation, um, I found the key to my happiness relative to freezing pipes is I don't keep a heated basement on purpose. I want to have a root cellar capability there. I found that I banked my house. And if I can stop the air infiltration through, through the granite foundation, I don't have freezing pipes. But the whole idea of, oh my goodness, you're actually asking a neighbor to take care of you while you're away. How crazy is that? And yet, and yet we've forgotten how to live in community where we are, co we are totally dependent upon our friends and neighbors. And I, can, I think at this time in our country's history, we need to rediscover a lot more of that in order to survive. You have a pizza oven too, don't you, Albie? So I, everybody comes to, you, to your house. I, I have a fire pit I built this summer at the end of the driveway. And I can tell you that's a magnet. It's in the ground. And we were surrounded by Hubbard squash. And we would sit there at night, bringing food out and sit around there and drinking beer and eating food, watch the chickens, watch the turkeys and watch the Hubbard Hubbard squash slowly overtake the lawn furniture. It was just a thrilling thing to do every night. Uh, but I played with the idea of what if you want to build a bake oven, but you're not sure where you want to put it and you want to share it with your friends. And I took a five foot cast iron bathtub and I took it to a, a commercial sandblaster because the bathtub has enamel on it. And some of that enamel has toxic metals in it, toxic things in it. They sandblasted and I didn't ask them where they put the remainders. I didn't want to do that. 
because that would be uh, risky. And uh, so for $150 or so to get it sandblasted, then we cut a hole in the end of it with a plasma torch and cut a hole in the top of it. I bought a, I bought a Rubbermaid cart with a 2,000 pound capacity. And I designed this oven so that you could roll it down to the road to your neighbors. It wouldn't be over 2,000 pounds. I put the oven upside down. I lined the floor with insulation blocks and a beautiful clay uh, fire brick made in France. And then I covered the whole thing with layers of cast refractory concrete and then insulation and a metal shell. So I have a portable bathtub oven that we can put on a trailer or a trundle down the road and we loan it to different people during the year. And uh, a big Halloween party uses it every year and we truck it over to their house and they make pizza for a hundred people and then we bring it back. Uh, so the idea of a bake oven is great. It builds community, but having a portable bake oven just adds another layer of fun to it. We're thinking uh, there was lots of political differences on our road this past fall. And uh, we're thinking the best way we can build community on our little road in rural Norwich Walk is to park our oven out front this summer and to have pizza parties where we entertain all of our neighbors, even those that we don't know and we don't agree with, we can share food with them and begin to build community. Can I come over? <laughs> yeah. You need to move to Maine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is unfortunately that time of the evening. So um, I wanted to say thank you to all of you. Uh, we'll, we'll extend it the last couple of minutes. What's your one takeaway for heating with wood from each of you? Um, so uh, for to share, um, Albie, you can share something other than pizza oven. I just had to bring it up because I love that. <laughs> yeah, well, let me just say that all of the information I've been talking about can be seen People can write to us, albybarden at gmail.com, and we can send you all the PDFs of the manuals we've written. Uh, and uh, I wrote lots and lots of blogs when I was uh, co-founder and president of Mainwood Heat. And so lots of the projects I've done can be found on the website. But if people want to reach me today, write to me at albybarden at gmail.com. We'll still be doing workshops once things clear up, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about masonry heaters. Great, thank you. John? Uh, well, I'll leave you with a, a resource. Um, if you would Google Renewable Heat NY, uh, that'll take you to the NYSERDA site. If you scroll down, there is a design assistance manual. It's a free download. It's about 240 pages. But it's a technical design assistance manual for both cordwood gasification and pellet boiler systems. It covers a lot of what... Uh, what those details are, it really focuses on the nuts and bolts of the design. And if you do go to Renewable Heat NY, uh, we've got a series of webinars coming up this spring that we'll get into, again, some of the details. Um, there's one coming up actually at the end of the month here, and then one in February, one in March. There's more information, just again, Google Renewable Heat NY, scroll down, you'll see a lot of resources there. Great, thank you. Lovely. Patrick? <clears throat> Wood heat is cool. Uh, it's just a beautiful thing. And, and Michael talked about it early in the show that like humans have a connection to fire. It's we uh, co-evolved with it. Um, it's a very enjoyable way to heat your place. But if you think it's easy, think again. <laughs> You're so so true. Um, so for anybody else who's here or watching the recording, um, the recording will be up on Green Building Advisor and we do encourage on the blog post continued discussions. There was a ton of questions in the chat and the discussion was just so great tonight we didn't get to all of them. So if your questions didn't get answered, um, put them up on GBA and uh, we'll keep the discussion going. So thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Good night everyone.